Arjuba from Gracia. This is the Rorschach Georgia update from the 14th of November, 2024. Quick summary of what's going down in Georgia. On Thursday, the 7th, the Weimar Triangle, which is France, President Emmanuel Macron, Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and Poland's Prime Minister Donald Tusk, made a joint statement about Georgia. They criticized the direction of the Georgian government. It's heading, particularly the recent legislation that clashes with European values, like the Russian law and the anti-LGBT law. They warned that unless Georgia continues its reforms and repeals these laws, they won't be able to support opening talks for the country's EU extension. Next up, on Monday the 11th, chairs of the foreign relations committees from eight European parliaments, Finland, Sweden, France, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, and Germany, visited Tbilisi. They met with Georgia's president, Salome Zurabashvili, members of civil society, NGOs, opposition parties. The members of Georgian Dream, or Otsneva, the ruling party, were afraid and declined to meet them. Delegation also attended a rally in front of parliament where they showed solidarity with pro-European demonstrators, called for an investigation into the election fraud, and criticized Otsneva for refusing to engage in dialogue with them. While on the topic of demonstrations, last week we reported that Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg unexpectedly arrived in Tbilisi to join the pro-European protests in solidarity. On Monday the 11th, she organized her own demonstrations in Tbilisi near Liberty Square. On Instagram, she urged people to protest against the wave of authoritarianism and exploitation sweeping through the Caucasus. Thunberg called out Ivanishvili, Putin, Erdogan, and the theocratic regime of Iran, but she focused most of her criticism on Ilham Aliyev, Azerbaijan's dictator. She condemned the regime for using the UN Climate Change Conference, currently happening in Azerbaijan's capital, Baku, as a facade to ramp up control under a false green agenda, all the while tightening its grip on power and escalating regional tensions. Speaking of Azerbaijan, on Monday the 11th, the wife and children of Azerbaijani journalist Afghan Sadigov and representatives of the media and NGOs held a demonstration in front of the Azerbaijani embassy in Tbilisi. Sadigov was detained in Georgia at the beginning of August. He's wanted in Azerbaijan, which has requested his extradition. According to the NGO Social Equality Center, Sadigov is being persecuted for criticizing President Aliyev, and there is no legal basis for his detention. His health is also deteriorating as he has been on hunger strike to protest his treatment. The court has extended his detention for extradition purposes by three months, and the NGO plans to appeal the decision. In other news, on Friday the 8th, four opposition parties met with Pavel Herzinski, the EU ambassador to Georgia. After the meeting, Badri Japaridze, one of the leaders of the Coalition Strong Georgia, or Zlieri, which includes Lelo, said that the parties are working together on a report that will present evidence of systemic fraud during the elections. Once the report is finished, they plan to give it to the ambassador to forward to Brussels. They hope the EU will send an international delegation to investigate the evidence on the ground and conclude that the elections were neither fair nor equal and were outright stolen by Oznaba, which they were. Interesting developments unfolded in the breakaway region of Abkhazia. On Monday the 11th, five opposition members were arrested with guns held to their heads. Soon after, hundreds of people, including family members of the detainees, gathered in front of the state security building where the authorities held the opposition members. The demonstrators then blocked several bridges in the city, leading to clashes with security forces. The authorities stationed heavy military equipment outside of Abkhazia's de facto presidential administration building. The arrests are likely connected to the investment agreement that the Abkhazian parliament is planning to ratify on the 15th of November, which would grant, yep, Russian citizens the right to build and buy property in Abkhazia. Opposition argues that this law could make Abkhazians a minority in their own country. Let us remind you that Abkhazians are already a minority in their own country, that Armenians outnumber them, and the Abkhazians' numbers are shrieking significantly. Russians' numbers are going way up. Since we're talking about Georgia's breakaway regions, on Thursday the 7th, the United Kingdom imposed sanctions on Anatoly Bibilov, the former de facto president of South Ossetia. This was part of a new sanctions package targeting suppliers that support Russia's military production, Russian-backed mercenary groups in sub-Saharan Africa, three private mercenary groups linked to the Kremlin, and 11 individuals. Bibilov is known for his ties to Russian mercenary groups, and the sanctions against him include asset freezes and travel bans. The UK government also accused him of being involved in destabilizing Ukraine and threatening its territorial integrity and independence. An unrelated note, on Tuesday the 12th, the mayor's office of Mestia, a municipality in the mountainous region, 
Sfanetti in the country's northwest issued a statement urging locals to turn off their crypto mining efforts. The past few years, Fanetti has become a hotspot for miners, leading to a huge spike in electricity demand. In the statement, the mayor's office warned that if the situation continues, it'll be impossible to provide an adequate supply of electricity. Similar warnings have been issued before. They've had little effect unless a law regulating the use of mining devices and electricity is passed the region could soon face electricity shortages. Keep in mind that Bidzina Ivanishvili also mines a ton of crypto, lots of it, but with free electricity that the people of Georgia subsidize and pay for. In October alone, Georgia's foreign exchange reserves dropped by over $625 million, with $213 million U.S. dollars just to maintain the value of the Georgian lari and prevent further currency depreciation. Roman Gotseridze, a member of parliament from the United National Movement, or Natsevi, pointed out that in just over a year, the reserves have dropped by 1.3 billion U.S. dollars, an even larger decline than during the COVID pandemic. Current reserve levels stand at just over $4 billion, which is very low for the country, with a moderate BB credit rating that could soon lead to its downgrade. Continuing with economics, on Monday, the 11th Georgia's National Statistics Office released data showing that the country's external trade grew by 5.5% from January to October compared to the same period last year. Total trade reached $19 billion. Data shows that Georgia's exports rose by over 7%, totaling $5.47 billion, while imports increased by almost 5%, reaching $13.5 billion. As a result, the country has a trade deficit of $8 billion, or 42% of the total trade turnover. The Georgian NGO Court Century reports that judges in the court of first and second instances will receive nearly 700,000 lati bonuses, which is over $25,000 for November. High Court of Justice of Georgia, the supreme oversight body responsible for regulating the judiciary, made the decision on Monday the 11th. Nazi Janezashvili, representative of Court Century, says judges receive these bonuses in addition to their salaries each month to strengthen their loyalty to the ruling party. The bonuses are not selective, and every judge gets one. This month, the bonus equals 50% of the fixed salary. Janezashvili explains that this arrangement ensures judges remain compliant with the current judicial and political system. Exactly. Wrap up this edition, some cultural news. The Cross Culture Festival will screen short movies, feature films, and documentaries by five Georgian women directors and take place in Berlin from the 22nd to 25th of November. Screenings will be held at the Half Sister Berlin Studio. Admission is free. This year, the festival focuses on democracy and social cohesion. Selection of directors and their movies were based on how they aligned with the year's theme. Check out the schedule and location details with the link in the show notes. And that's it for this week. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for sticking around for this episode of the Rorschach Georgia Update. If you have questions, thoughts, or just want to say hi, reach out to info at Rorschach.com. Email. Don't forget to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Nachandis. Nachandis.